first beginnings of our society. Small boats have put out from the ports of this country, braving the hardships of sea life to earn a precarious living from the ocean's wealth. With the industrialization of our times, new methods have come about for increasing the fisherman's haul. But oddly enough, the most valuable fish, the halibut, is still caught by the oldest of all methods, that of hook and line. For this fish, the line boats must steam five days out from port into Icelandic waters. They alter their fishing grounds with the seasons. Their catch varies, but halibut is their prize. They must have enough ice aboard to preserve their catch and their stores for a month. Their herring bait too must be used frozen and fresh. The halibut is most fastidious. They must load up with fuel to steam 3,000 miles. They must be able to change their ground each night should the need arise. In all, the ship's engines will be turning continually for up to 30 days and nights. With the tide, the ship puts out on her long voyage. She is only 120 feet long on the water. Soon she will be rolling like a thing damned. But as she leaves her moorings, she moves slowly round to follow the sun. Fishermen are a superstitious race. Be it ever so much easier, the skipper will never maneuver his ship against the sun's rotation until she is cleared of the harbor. Now she will steam over a thousand miles, her mizzen sail set to steady her to a roll that is purgatory to a landsman. To walk her decks in a flat calm is to know a sense of achievement. To do so with a sea running, encumbered by heavy boots against the constant wash, with areas soon covered with fish slime, is to tempt fate. As the fishing ground is reached, the hauling winch is connected, and the skipper sends down one of the crew to read the log. From experience, he has chosen his position. As they lie hove to, the lines are drawn up from the hold, and a dand, or boy, is put out to mark the position. The first day's shooting will be a recurrently new adventure. This time they will strike gold. This time their lines will not break, but full to the scuppers, she will be steaming back tomorrow or the next day to land, to their womenfolk, to that nirvana of all toilers, the cosy welcome of a four-ale bar. Perhaps one day this will happen. At four o'clock in the morning, fishing starts. As the ship steams slowly forward, the hooks are baited in careful and rhythmic rotation with frozen herring, one half to each hook. In turn, each of four men takes his correct hook in anticipation, baits it, then, waiting his moment, casts it over the side. A further linesman checks the line to see that it runs evenly away. One error, and the line would have to be cut. Should a hook which will hold a 20-stone halibut, catch into a man's flesh or his clothing, he would quickly be pulled over and under. There must be no hitch from start to finish. Now the big moment arrives. After some four hours, the dand and anchor at the final end of the line are hauled aboard. The anchor is attached to a stout line known as the trotter. At intervals of 21 feet on the trotter are attached lighter lines each nine feet in length, with a hook at the end. In all, there are 24 lines attached after the trotter, covering some 10 miles. There are six linesmen to each ship, including the skipper. Each owns four lines for which he is responsible. Each will take his turn at the winch and haul until his line is done. The hauler coils his line. The man to follow stands at his side and brings in the fish removes the hooks from their jaws, throws the fish into a pond, and tips the hook. That is, he winds the line round the haft of the hook to stop it catching or doing damage. Should several fish appear in quick succession, like this batch of cod, the nearest man will drop his work for the moment and equally unhook, tip, or remove the fish into the pond. To get through the day's work, the hauling must go on without interruption for the lines must be laid afresh each morning, as the halibut seems to prefer its food by day. A gaff is used to land the fish, and a pronged fork to facilitate unhooking them, and also to serve as a crowbar to stun them. 
should they take a dislike to their new surroundings. As the line comes to an end, someone supplies a fresh basket without asking. Another picks up the loosely coiled line and takes it forward. Under the whale back of the ship at the bow, others again are preparing the lines for the next day's shot. The hooks are untipped and carefully examined. If they're damaged, new ones replace them. If the line is worn or frayed, the bad part is cut out and the ends spliced. One break and the hauling may be held up several hours. That will mean no sleep. Each man makes it a matter of pride that his line shall not cause trouble. Because of the extreme pressure under a thousand feet of water, drawing the line up from this tremendous depth necessitates considerable skill on the part of the man in the wheelhouse. He must give the ship sufficient and constant motion to counteract any tide and ease the hauling for the man at the winch. The gutting, heading and removal of fish livers goes on throughout the day after the first batch of fish has accumulated. These gulls have followed the ship from port, being sure of their rations, which only their own competition will reduce. The fish surgery is incredible in its accuracy and speed. A full pond of fish will be cleaned and cleared in the space of a few minutes. Slow ahead signals alignment of the skipper. The hall is getting rather stiff. Yes, it's definitely making heavier work. Maybe there's something worthwhile coming up. You can't afford to take chances. Maybe, hold it! If it is a halibut, and they're mighty hard to see in the water, it's careful, does it? A jerk on the line will free him immediately. If it is a halibut, a butt, as the linesmen call it, it's all hands to the job. What is it? It's a butt! His head must be kept up or they'll lose him. A real genie he is, as the fishermen call all halibut over ten stone. A precise incision and his liver is out. A quick movement and his gallbladder is over the side. The bile, oddly enough, is an excellent cleanser. The fishermen use it to spruce up their Sunday best. Another but, <laughs> things are looking up. Again, the swift moving knife is at work. The valuable livers are carefully selected and kept. They belong to the firemen, as the deckhands are called. They are the crew's perks, to be shared amongst the six of them. Yet another but. Maybe the cameraman aboard isn't a Jonah after all. Maybe it will be a big shot this trip. This is the time of smiles. The crew is joking and laughing. Nothing seems can depress them now. Another liver. That's another couple of pints. Nothing can possibly go wrong today, even the cod are gargantuan. Another check to the skipper to ease her off a little. Everything is going ahead now with the regularity of built production in a factory. The mate, the oldest hand at the game, can still bring a genie aboard single-handed. It's rumored that he eats their livers raw, that's probably a libel. As the halibut liver bucket fills up, one of the firemen takes it over to the 40-gallon barrels at the side of the ship. These are where the butt livers are stored. The other types of liver are put into a steam boiler by the fireman and the oil crudely drawn off. The extraction of halibut liver oil is a complex process. These livers will be carried home as they are. As the day draws slowly towards its close, the cook, having finished his own chores, 
takes a hand at cutting up tusk into dollops, which will be used as bait along with the herring the following morning. Now the fish are stored in the hold amongst the ice and salt. This is the mate's job below. He is responsible for the condition of the shot when it is delivered to market. The butts are most carefully scrubbed and handled. A heritage from the days when they were bought for appearance as well as quality. The tradition remains. The end trotter is coming in. Soon the dand will be aboard and the day's work finished. Today there's been no trouble. It is but half past ten. The fishermen have had a good day. They've worked only 16 hours. During the night, the two engineers keep watch in turn. As the ship is moved by the tide from the marking dand, they start their engines and steam slowly back to it. Today, things are different. The breeze is up, the ship is rolling like a pig. The deck is mostly awash. The crew have taken to their oil skins. Hauling the line is a tricky business. Many of the larger fish will be lost as the ship jerks and plunges. Perhaps, too, the line may break. This will mean creeping. That is to say, the ship will be headed a short distance into the tide, the engine stopped and grappling irons thrown out. Then, as the tide moves the ship slowly forward across the fishing line, the man with the grappling line hopes that his hooks will catch onto it. And this at a thousand feet. The hauling is getting stiff. Is this another big genie, or has the line got caught up? Free, far too free. The line has broken. This means no sleep tonight. The crew stand about disconsolate. A dand is put out to mark the position. The mate stands by with the grappling irons ready. Over they go. One. Two, three, four. The mate hauls his line taut and tries to feel the bottom. Now there's nothing to do but stand about and wait. Come the creepers. One. Are they going to be lucky? Two. They've got it. And so fishing starts again. Sometimes with luck sometimes without, until the hold is full and the skipper decides that this night they will pack up and start their long steam home. During these five days, the winch is taken down, the decks are washed and cleared, and the gear stored away below. The men are now content and are counting the hours until they are once again ashore. By the time the ship docks, every single man of the crew has washed, shaved and changed out of an unacknowledged deference to the land, his hometown and his womenfolk. Customs officials come aboard to seal the bond and ensure that for the three days the fishermen are in port, they shall be treated as landsmen and pay landsmen's prices. 
Next morning at four o'clock, the unloading starts in the market. The fish are hauled ashore, laid out according to weight and category, and marked for their various places of distribution. Later in the day, the little oil boat comes alongside, and with its steam winch, it soon hauls aboard the barrels in which the halibut livers have been stored. These will be taken to the factory and processed to remove the oil. And so, with the last job done, the line boat lies solitary and deserted, for the moment forgotten by her crew. But in two short days, she will be seeing them all over again. Another Icelandic voyage will commence. Before then, however, the halibut livers will have been taken to the factory for processing to remove the valuable oil. Here they will be made to give up those vitamin treasures unsuspected until 20 years ago. These rich supplies of vitamins, vitamin A and D, are found dissolved in the oil of the halibut's liver. Their extraction is normally carried out on a large scale in the factory. Here it is demonstrated as a laboratory process only. The livers are first minced to allow reagents to deal with them more quickly. They are now placed in a tank. A solution of caustic potash is added. The potash breaks up the tissue and materials of the livers and so releases the oil. For this to happen, the contents of the tank must be brought to the boil. On the large scale, this is done by blowing in live steam. Here, a gas burner is used. The mixture is then allowed to stand for several hours. Some of the fats present in the halibut liver oil form a soap with the potash, and this turns the liberated oil into an emulsion. This emulsion is broken so that the oil floats to the top, after which it can be separated from the soap by drawing off the soap layer. To ensure complete separation, the crude oil is washed by agitation with water and then passed through a centrifuge. The oil is next deodorized, that is, the volatile substances responsible for the fishy smell are removed. For this purpose it is filtered, as shown here on the actual factory scale, and then led to a large closed vessel connected to powerful vacuum pumps. Steam is blown through the oil to volatilize the fishy components, which are carried off as vapor by the vacuum to condensers. The oil is now clean and clear and fit for consumption. Having extracted the oil on a large scale from a catch of livers, the next thing is to determine its potency, that is to say, the amounts of vitamins A and D present. This is always done in the laboratory. The potency varies from fish to fish, according to age, season, etc., and also from catch to catch. For the vitamin A tests, the oil must be made as free as possible from non-vitamin material. Accuracy is the keynote of this and the following testing operations, since the amount of vitamins present, though small, is very precious. The fatty, non-vitamin materials in an accurately weighed amount of oil are turned into a soap by boiling with alcoholic caustic potash. The small amount of material which has not been turned into a soap now contains all the vitamins. This material is dissolved out by shaking with ether. On standing, the vitamin in ether solution separates from the water and soap as a distinct layer. The soap solution is drawn off, shaken with fresh ether and the process repeated. This is performed some five or six times. The various ether solutions are then mixed and washed by shaking with water and again separated. The ether is finally removed by being distilled in a current of nitrogen. The vitamin A is left behind in the flask as a residue. This residue is now dissolved in a known volume of solvent in this case, alcohol. 
for the actual determination of the amount of vitamin A present. The determination is now done by physical chemical methods. These depend on the fact that the solution absorbs light of a certain wavelength, namely 328 millimicrons. The amount of light absorbed being proportional to the amount of vitamin A present and the thickness of the layer of solution through which it is made to pass. Unfortunately, this light is invisible, being ultraviolet light. It may, however, be measured by means of a photoelectric cell, since when it falls on such a cell, it produces an electric current, the amount of which depends on the intensity of light. When the vitamin A solution is placed in the beam of ultraviolet light, the vitamin absorbs some of the light, and so less light reaches the cell. The current is reduced. The amount of reduction is proportional to the amount of vitamin A, so that by measuring the fall in current, we can calculate the amount of vitamin A in the solution. The instrument used for this purpose is the photoelectric spectrophotometer. The rack containing quartz cells is removed. A sample of the vitamin A solution under test is poured into a fresh cell and inserted into the rack, which is then replaced. With a blank cell in the beam, the wavelength of 328 millimicrons is selected and the control adjusted so that the needle on the dial is at zero. On bringing the vitamin solution into the beam, the current falls. It is compensated by a further current controlled by a dial which is calibrated to read the percentage of light transmitted. From this, the amount of vitamin A present can be calculated. So much for the vitamin A. The amount of vitamin D present in the oil can only be measured biologically, that is to say, by measuring its effect upon animals. Rats are most commonly used. These are taken from colonies carefully tended and specially inbred to ensure similarity of behavior. The principle is that large numbers of young rats are fed on a diet of a carefully controlled composition containing all the necessities except vitamin D. After three weeks, they develop rickets. This is shown by X-raying the rats at intervals until the rickitic condition is apparent. The rats are given an anesthetic and placed beneath the X-ray tube on a shielded photographic film. A standard exposure is made and the film developed to show the bone formation. The rickitic condition shows itself on the film as a gap between the limb joints being most apparent at the femur. This is due to the lack of bone growth owing to the absence of vitamin D. On the right is a rat with rickets, used as a check. On the left, a rat with normal bone formation. The rats are now divided into six groups. Groups one, two, and three are given known doses of an international standard preparation of vitamin D. Group 2 getting double the amount of group 1 and group 3 double that of group 2. The groups 4, 5 and 6 are given the preparation being tested. 5 getting double the amount of 4 and 6 double that of 5. The dose is given by the mouth with a micro syringe which accurately measures doses of one hundredth of a millimeter. After 10 days on the vitamins, X-ray photographs of the bones of the foreleg are taken. They show bone formation which is proportional to the amount of vitamin D given to the rat. The photographs are now examined by an expert who assigns a score to each bone by comparison with a standard set showing 12 degrees of cure between complete rickets, naught, and complete cure, 12. In this way, each rat of the group is given a score and the average score for the group is found. Since a known amount of the standard preparation of vitamin D has been given a known score, it is possible to calculate from the observed score of the test sample how much vitamin D is present. The calculations are lengthy and complicated and require a calculating machine for their rapid performance.
Before the oil can be sent to its consumers all over the world, it must be adjusted to a fixed content of the vitamins A and D, so that the consumer knows that when he takes a definite dose of oil, he is getting definite amounts of vitamins. For the oil is but the vehicle, the vitamins the thing. This fixed vitamin content is affected by mixing the calculated amounts of oils from the various catches in large tanks. The blend is finally clarified by passing through centrifugal machines, after which it is again tested to check strength. It is now ready for making up either in bottles or in capsule form. A certificate of the vitamin potency determined in the final test is attached to each bottle or package of capsules. This practice was introduced by the Crookes laboratory as a guarantee of the quality of their material. Now, untouched by hand, gallon after gallon of halibut liver oil is mechanically bottled or filled into convenient gelatine capsules. The world's need is great. This concentrated vitamin finds its way far afield. Disease must be combated. Inadequate food supplies must be augmented with the necessary health-giving material. And so must badly selected diets. Health is prepared for distribution. This is the end of the long chain, a chain in which man has added his skill and knowledge at each link. The natural cycle of organic life concentrates and stores essential vitamins in the liver of the halibut. The fisherman adds his courage and endurance. The technician his labors in operating the machines and extracting the oils. The chemist his precision and skill to test and analyze. The doctor the biologists find out how best use may be made of the vitamins to satisfy human needs. That first triumphal discovery of vitamins some 35 years ago has borne its full fruit. The small, rich globules of concentrated health harvested from the Arctic seas are now available to all people in all lands. <laughs>